Okay, everyone, thank you all for joining us. It is time for us to get started. Um, welcome to the NAGT webinar. The NAGT webinar series is your one-stop shop for strengthening work in earth education. Webinars in the series feature novel and innovative work in earth education research and pedagogy, new teaching materials, and the classroom and professional experiences of people like you. The NAGT webinar series is free and open to the public, and we encourage you to invite your colleagues to attend and join the discussion. On the screen and linked in the chat is a link to the webinar series where you can find the webinar schedule, an archive of past events, and information on our sponsoring projects and programs. You can find slides, resources, and recordings for each webinar, including today's, through the webinar archives. Before we get started, please take a moment to review the Zoom controls on the screen. We ask that you leave your microphones muted and your cameras off. If you have questions and comments along the way, we encourage you to enter those into the chat box. Webinar presenters and staff will be monitoring the chat. A reminder that all participants in NAGT meetings and events are expected to abide by the NAGT code of conduct, which applies in all venues, events, and online forums associated with NAGT. Please read the full NAGT code of conduct policy linked in the chat for details. Today's webinar is titled Geocode, using GPS data to visualize plate movement and assess earthquake risk. Presented by Chris Lohr, research, research assistant at the Concord Consortium. Stephanie Sievers, recipient of the 2018 NAGT Colorado Outstanding Earth Science Teacher Award and science teacher at Evergreen High School in Evergreen, Colorado. And Shelly Olds, science education specialist at UNAFCO. Thank you all so much for participating in the NAGT webinar series. Go ahead and take it away. Great, I'm gonna share my screen. I hope you all can see that. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, and thank you to NAGT for inviting us to speak at the webinar today. Uh, my name is Chris Lohr and I'm a research assistant at the Concord Consortium. Uh, Concord is a nonprofit organization focused on developing innovative educational technology for STEM learning. Uh, I work on three very cool earth science projects that I encourage you to check out on our website. And today we're gonna showcase just one of them. Joining me today are two of my colleagues, Shelly Olds from UNAFCO and Stephanie Sievers from Evergreen High School in Evergreen, Colorado. Uh, there is one more partner that I would be remiss not to mention, and that is the seismologists and the volcanologists at the University of South Florida that have helped us very much with the science behind the ideas uh, and models we're going to show today. So we're here to present some of the products of an NSF funded project that we have been working on called GeoCode and more specifically about the simulation in the curriculum that we've developed that allows students to use GPS data to visualize plate movement and assess earthquake risk. Because we're funded by NSF, uh, everything we're about to show you and everything that Concord produces is all free and uh, available online to the public. So uh, you're welcome to go and try this out right after this. Uh, actually, you're gonna try it out during. So here's just a quick overview of what we're gonna be doing today. Uh, I'm going to provide an overview of the GeoCode project and its goals. Uh, Stephanie is going to discuss how GPS data, I'm sorry, Shelly is going to discuss how GPS data can be used by students in the classroom to investigate land movement. Uh, I'm going to demo the GeoCode model and some of its features. Uh, you're going to get hands-on experience with the block coding in the GeoCoder and see some of the, a little snapshot of the curriculum that students actually go through um, in, the, in the curriculum module. And then Stephanie is going to share some pilot testing results from an implementation that she did with her fellow Evergreen teachers in ninth grade classrooms uh, remotely during the pandemic. So here's a quick overview on the GeoCode project. Our goal on this project is to integrate computational thinking and geoscience concepts in order to engage students in creating visualizations that help them understand and assess the hazards, risks, and impacts of volcanic eruptions and seismic events. So we want students to use code while they engage in an authentic problem because that gets them more interested in it. We use very large data sets, uh, which Shelly will talk about, and uh, using a computer makes it possible for students to manipulate all of the data that we give them. Uh, the goal is to see that student reasoning of the geoscience problems is enhanced by using code and computational thinking. So both of these concepts should kind of be lifted up and uh, you know, make each other uh, for deeper learning by using them together. So for the context in the seismic hazards curriculum, uh, we want something that is authentic and interesting. So 
we identified a real world geologic problem uh, that scientists work on every day, which is assessing the risk and impact of a potential earthquake in California. Uh, there's one specific called the big one that is uh, most talked about. And, you know, we're not aiming for that in this module. We're more aiming at general seismic events, but uh, all that can be applied to the big one. Um, there are several questions to answer when approaching the problem of risk forecasting and forecasting, you know, earthquakes in general. Some of the questions are, uh, you know, what are the GPS data telling us? What are the most likely locations for earthquakes to happen? And are the impacts of an earthquake different in different locations? So all of the science that students do in the GeoCoder module lies at the intersection of these uh, computational thinking and geoscience concepts, which is right where we want them to be. So for example, to make this map shown uh, on the slide here, uh, scientists need to use several different things. Uh, they use GPS and satellite imagery, they use strain calculations and tectonic models. And then on this specific map, they added the population data in around the population centers. And that adds um, the dimension of risk into it because it has people and potential impact. Uh, so we wanna peel back the layers that I described in this map and have students discover for themselves how to produce this and what it means and what it represents. So to talk more of the GPS data in the module, and how it can be used for this inquiry-based science. I'm gonna hand it over to Shelly. Thank you, Chris. And uh, so good to see everyone here today. Um, a few of you may be familiar about who UNEFCO is and what do we do. Um, and there might be some people who've never uh, heard of UNEFCO before and that's okay. Uh, we're a nonprofit university governed consortium, meaning universities around the country and world have representatives and they help guide what it is that UNAVCO looks at. Um, we facilitate geoscience research, meaning we have instruments that we can share. Um, we have data that is archived and we have educational resources as well that use geodesy and we support researchers in many different fields um, and, uh, and helping them apply geodesy to many different science areas as I have in the, the lower right. Um, we're more, most particularly looking at the earthquake hazards and seismo geodesy. It's a new term, uh, maybe the last five, six years. And we'll talk a little bit about that in just a moment. Let's go on to the next slide. So before I dive into what GPS is and how you can use it, uh, we have a chat question for you. So down in the lower uh, bar, there's the chat, the chat um, link. And we'd like you to kind of put in the chat area, have you used GPS in your life? How have you used it? And how have you used it in science and science education? So let's take a few minutes and go ahead and put that into the chat area. Don't be shy. Okay, thank you. Yes, we're seeing lots of different ways. We'll give you another 30 seconds. Yes, for travel. Yes, I think a lot of people use that every single day. Tectonic modeling, um, not in science education. Hopefully we can make you a believer and uh, you know, see its utility. Um, individual patterns for life, for mobility assessment. That's awesome. Um, find places, yes. Um, hotspot tracking, volcanic monitoring, yep, absolutely used all the time in there. In fact, it's being used right now on Soufriere and um, Iceland um, and Kilauea. Um, it's in our phones, yes. Yeah, when I first started teaching this, only a few phones had it in there and now everybody. 
Um, a recovering geodesist. Ah, yes, thank you, Matt. <laughs> so good to see you. Um, research, haven't used it in teaching, used it for contour maps, um, visualization, stream, stream flow visual analysis. That's really cool. Um, and inflation and deflation. Yes, absolutely. That's used quite a bit. Um, and so for those who haven't used it in their lives, uh, let's go on to the, the next slide. Yeah, so there's a lot of ways you can explore your world with GPS data. And there's lots of ways that you can jump into this data. Um, and, and, you know, with the NGSS, uh, it, it spans everything from students collecting the data themselves to analyzing it themselves, creating visualizations to help understand the concepts. And with GPS, um, you could collect the data yourself with a phone and it would be already processed for you. And it's, you know, good enough within a couple meters. If you want to get it down to where you can use it in scientific studies, uh, you would need to process it some, and that's not something that you would have high schoolers necessarily doing in a few few class sessions. Um, there's all sorts of things that that get in the way between the GPS signals that come from the satellites, as illustrated with those little satellites, um, and the unit that's on the ground, which is pretty big. You know, it's a couple feet across, um, and. And that's something to consider. How much time do you have to have students work with data? They may look at just one location. They may look at multiple locations. They may start from tables and graphs. If they need to look at all the locations at once, then you're kind of moving into the realm of big data if they're doing actual quantitative analysis. Let's go on to the next slide. So just as a summary, you know, you might have the start from a table of data. And I have made this table deliberately small because there's 7,400 rows of data. And if you've ever done this in the classroom, you have students graphing up just uh, time versus let's say the north motion, and you could end up with a graph looking like what's on the right. I threw that into numbers and I deliberately let it stay messy. Um, it's really hard to read that bottom x-axis, um, the y-axis, um, you know, actually the trend is like super straight. It's like, whoa, what's going on here? Um, mathematicians really like a lot of GPS data. So you could do one at a time and let's go on to the next one. And so you could start, you could have students jump in and start with the graphs themselves as shown on the left. And they could come up with the trend in the two directions um, and the velocity for each direction and they could add it up graphically or using Pythagorean theorem um, and come up with the resultant vector. Next slide. And then you could put it on a map to kind of show, you know, here's Iceland. Without even knowing much about Iceland, you could see this, these two pieces of land are moving away from each other. And there's a fair bit of unpacking. You know, students aren't used to seeing three dimensions of motion at once in a graph. And now they're unpacking it and they're seeing it in two dimensions, but still, that's pretty complicated. Well, now let's go on to the next one. Now analyze this, you know, quantitatively analyze this. And you could use the, the GPS poster that we've developed for the Western United States. It has, I'd say three quarters of the GPS stations uh, shown. Each red arrow is actually a vector. It, it is scaled. Um, each one of those is a high precision GPS station. And if you wanted to like zoom in, you could use the GPS velocity viewer. And, you know, our eyes actually are a really good big data analysis tool. So that's really cool. But let's say you want to go more, you know, you can go beyond the patterns. And that's where, that's where geocode comes in because now students can take the data and actually, oh, wouldn't it be nice if they had an algorithm there where they could like go through a whole bunch of stations and pick their area and study it in more detail. That's where geocoder comes in. So let's go on to the next slide. 
and I'm going to hand this back to to Chris. Great, thank you, Shelley. Uh, so, right, exactly. So students can use data in all different ways. GPS data can be used in all different ways, uh, but what in the geocoder, what they use it for is uh, seismic movement, right? So uh, real seismologists use GPS movement as the basics for almost everything that, we, that they do, uh, well, when it comes to land movement. And we have integrated that GPS data into several scaffolded steps so that students can understand what it is showing and how it can be used. Some of the activities that students do in the module with the GPS station are they plot the daily movement of one or more GPS stations over time. So you can see a dot for each day and then you can watch the trail kind of at, on the north graph that Shelly showed. Uh, they identify trends in the GPS velocity in California. They identify which areas in California have high differential land movement because high differential land movement leads to strain which leads to earthquakes. And then they create different maps of strain rate throughout California and the surrounding region. Um, and uh, we prompt students to identify the level of risk, uh, especially with this last bullet point, the maps of strain rate, the level of risk of different locations. Um, and risk is something that we're really deliberate about in this module. Risk has two, two factors to it, both the likelihood of an earthquake happening and the impact of an earthquake hazard. So we combine these two variables, the likelihood of an earthquake and the potential impact, and then we get students to conclude and reason about the level of risk of different locations in California. So here's the geocoder. I'm actually gonna to go to a different tab and just show you a little bit about what it is to do all these things that uh, we've talked about with the data. So uh, if I wanna show all the GPS stations on the map, kind of like what Shelly just did, I'm gonna to go to my block, block category menu. I'm gonna put it in the program workspace here and I'm gonna show GPS stations, all of the GPS stations. It makes a nice snap when you click them together. I'm gonna show all of the station velocities by leaving this uh, box ticked here. And we're gonna see something pop up on the map visualization. So here are all the stations that UNAVCO generally, generously provided to us in California and the surrounding region. Uh, you can see all of their uh, velocities shown by the blue arrow uh, with a small scale bar here. And I can click on any one of these and I can see its ID, well, its name, latitude and longitude, speed and direction. We also have uh, special blue stations here that we have uh, every day, their location for every day um, since they came online. And uh, I'll go over that a little bit and you'll get to play with that data a little bit too. So uh, say I wanted to filter this data. I wanna see only the ones that are moving at a minimum speed of like 20 millimeters per year. So I'm gonna bring my filter block in. Uh, I'm gonna put the all GPS stations uh, into the select from slot. So it picks from that data set of all the stations showing on the map. I'm gonna set the minimum speed to 20 millimeters per year. I'm gonna hit run. And what we see pretty interesting is that all of the stations, almost all of the stations besides this one holdout on the east side of California, they go away because they're all uh, have a lower speed than 20 millimeters per year. We're all on the West Coast, uh, they stay there. And so, you know, this is how we get students to start recognizing the trends and some of the patterns in the data and the GPS data. So then they find that there is a lot of differential movement in California. You know, one side is moving much faster than the other side. <clears throat> and they start to wonder why. So we show them this deformation simulation. Uh, it has two plates, plate one and plate two, and three GPS stations that we kind of view the window of uh, because we have their three coordinates and we know how fast they're moving. So I'm gonna go to my deformation category and pick out the deformation block. I'm copy this three times. So for plate one, I'm gonna set the speed to 20 millimeters per year and the direction to zero, which is north. And for plate two, I'm gonna set the speed to you know, 25 mil mil millimeters per year and the direction to 180. So it's going due south. So we're getting perfect shear strain here. They're, they're moving perfectly past each other. And so I'll hit run and we'll see the other grid disappear and we can just see the grid inside. We can see how the lines bend as the simulation runs. For 500,000 years, this is how much the land around this fault that are moving at, the, with the two plates moving at this speed would look if it never had an earthquake. 
but this is not realistic, right? The land just doesn't keep on bending and stretching like this. It's not completely elastic. Uh, so what we're doing is we're working for our next version. We're going to add earthquakes into this. So when the, when the lines bend, you'll be able to see them snap, rebound back. You'll be able to see them snap back just like the brittle deformation of the, the brittle cold crust would. Uh, and you'll see that several times uh, throughout the 500, 500,000 year time period. And in that way, students can see that the plates are always moving, but there's an earthquake cycle, right? So an earthquake happens, more strain builds up, and then another earthquake happens. Earthquake happens, another strain builds up. So um, this is how they kind of see earthquakes and plate movement. And once they understand that, they understand the concept of strain. So I'm going to show strain on the map now, compute the strain rate, which is strain buildup over time color the map by strain rate, and we allow them to uh, choose between an equal interval method or a logarithmic method to, in order to group the data and therefore visualize the data in different ways. I'm gonna pick the logarithmic method. I'm also gonna show strain rate value. <clears throat> so we're gonna compute the strain rate, color the map by that strain rate, and then show the value of the strain rate. So it creates triangles between all of the GPS stations that we have and then it colors that triangle based on the strain rate value, which we can see here in the strain rate key that the purple and blue areas have the highest strain rate, meaning they're, they're deforming at the highest rate. And uh, if we can picture the San Andreas Fault here, we can see that the purple and blue areas, they kind of trail right along the San Andreas Fault, which is kind of what we would expect, right? And then out in Nevada, where there's not as much tectonic activity, um, the values are much lower. So we encourage students to make this map and go through the process. And uh, then we overlay uh, population data on top of it on a different map. So I'm looking at San Fran here. Uh, and we can see that San Fran has a ton of population. Well, we know that San Francisco has a high population and a very high strain rate. So we can say that the risk for San Francisco of an earthquake, a potentially damaging earthquake, is very high because they have a high potential for damage and that there's a lot of infrastructure, infrastructure and road and building and you know, transportation lines there. And they have a very high strain rate, uh, meaning there's a high likelihood of an earthquake. Um, that's not all the features, but uh, you're gonna get to play with it in a second. Uh, so I'm just gonna explain the curriculum module a little bit. We've embedded the geocoder in a module where uh, students can do five activities designed to take about five 45 minute class periods. Uh, the module uses the real world GPS data in the geocoder to help students explore land movement as recorded by GPS. Uh, they will go through several investigations, scaffolding them to a point where students know what GPS record, what the trends are in California, how deformation works, when earthquakes occur, and what a strain map is used for and what it shows. So by the end of the module, students will be able to reason about the hazards and risks of earthquakes in different parts of California based on their interpretations of the data visualizations. So uh, that's the end of my speech. I'm gonna hand it over to Stephanie, who's gonna tell you a little bit more about the theory relating to NGSS, NGSS and uh, how her implementations went. Oh, I'm gonna stop sharing. You're muted, Stephanie. There we go. I couldn't get, I clicked it, but I didn't quite click it. Um, sorry about that. I'll start over. <laughs> Hi, I'm Stephanie Sievers, and um, I am a high school science teacher in Evergreen, Colorado. Um, I wanted to start out by talking briefly about the NGSS three-dimensional learning model. And I think that many of you here are familiar with it. You probably have seen this graphic before, but I just wanted to review really quickly and talk about what it is. So the NGSS three-dimensional learning model is a vision 
for teaching science, not just as a body of knowledge, right, but as a, a process of acquiring knowledge, a way that we refine and revise knowledge. And that was the vision for creating these three dimensions. And so this graphic here, the orange is meant to represent the core ideas, those concepts, science content, right? The green uh, on the bottom, the cross cutting that is supposed to represent the dimension of these concepts that cut across all dimensions of science. So if you are teaching biology, chemistry, physics, geology, astronomy, whatever you're teaching, there are these co concepts that are in common with all these disciplines like patterns, cause and effect, stability and change, things like that. These are things that um, will help us learn science in an interdisciplinary way by learning those. Um, the <laughs> By the way, I'm laughing. I considered blurring out my background, but I wanted to leave my QR code just in case someone wanted to scan it. It's for my students and it turns the lights on. So whoever, I know that there is a maker nerd with us and that makes me really happy that um, to have you here and my lights came on. So um, at any rate, the third dimension is those practices, right? What are the practices that science and engineers engage in, in the process of doing science? And, and ideally we will learn those in the classroom as well. So that's a three dimensional learning model that those three dimensions really constitute a way of teaching science through doing science and that students are doing science. Now, I am a geologist by training and I am an earth and space science teacher and I believe that the earth and space sciences are um, a little bit special and a little bit different in terms of the way they kind of fit into the classroom. And so I wanted to ask you if you wouldn't mind thinking for a minute and putting something in the chat about any challenges that you may have encountered with implementing the 3D learning model in your earth and space science lessons. So if you have any thoughts on that, if you wanted to put those into the chat and tell us about it, we would love to hear about it. I'll start us off. Um, <laughs> so I don't see the chat. Maybe it just takes you a while to type, but there's just a lag between the one you want. Oh, there you go. Some people are putting. Um, but I'll start us off and say that labs can be challenging, right? Um, I, as much as I want to go up, um, take the kids up to see Kilauea erupting, sadly, I am not able to. Hmm, modeling, yeah. I think you might want to clarify what you mean by the 3D learning model. I think you mean the NGSS one, right? Three, what four. I just mentioned. So that practice, how do we do science? We're, we're teaching science by doing science. How do you, are you able to do science in your earth and space classroom um, as easily as maybe you can if you're when you're teaching physics or biology? And I think there are some challenges. Mm, a wide range of abilities. Oh, the amount of time. I know. I wish that I could have sort of a half day <laughs> to do some, some lessons in earth and space science. Mm -hmm. Concepts being abstract. Oh, people being, students being intimidated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Deborah, the scale is what we're talking about huge scales, right? And not just huge physical scales, but temporal scales. We're talking about things, processes that you cannot recreate in the classroom. They take millions of years, literally, right? Mm. Getting students to think in three dimensions, that's the real um, three dimensions in the world, not just the 3D model in the classroom, yeah. Yeah, so you have you have some good ideas and some interesting answers. Um, and I agree, I've encountered, I feel you, I agree with every single thing I've seen in the chat. And I think that it can be difficult. So when I'm teaching earth and space science and I want to use this, um, and, and uh, some people are saying, oh, maybe I'm not familiar with the NGSS 3D learning model, but just that concept of, 
inquiry science, right? Doing science, the practices like 5E or however you, uh, whatever your pedagogy is or however you teach your science, most of us, I think, want the students to be doing science in the classroom. And that can be a challenge with some earth and space science lessons. Oh, a couple more, I wanna read them before I click onward. Oh, yeah, Kim Castens. I just met her recently, great, great recommendation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and lots of, there are lots of models available and more and more these days. Okay, so I'm gonna move on. Thanks for answering. Uh, and I bring this up, the reason that I brought it up is that I wanted to talk to you about why I chose to pilot the geocode module. So I, in fall 2019, oh, does anyone remember 2019? <laughs> the days, the days before the pandemic, before we knew. Um, in fall 2019, I got an email that was kind of a forwarded, forwarded, forwarded email about potentially piloting this new geocode module. In fact, that one was for the volcanic hazards module. And we have since gone on um, to pilot the seismic hazards module that we're talking about today as well. And it interested me right away, really because these geocode modules were designed with the 3D three-dimensional learning model in mind, right? They were designed at Conquer Consortium from the from the ground up with the thought of students being able to practice science while they're learning about science. And so that's why I wanted to respond immediately to that email. The geocode module really lets students get an opportunity to approximate, approximate the practices of real seismologists. So when I'm in my classroom thinking about how I'm teaching ninth grade, so I'm thinking that there are probably a lot of middle and high school teachers here, I'm not really sure about all of your backgrounds, but what is the entryway into seismology? Seismology is an incredibly technical and complex field, and it's a little bit difficult to think about how can my students do seismology. So the geocode module is great. They can approximate some of these practices and get that third dimension, that practices that in our graphic, it's that blue, kind of blue purple dimension in there. Uh, and the other thing that I really liked was that uh, the, that tectonic motions map that Shelly showed you and I'll show you again, that students really are going to create their own the, as opposed to just interpreting it, which is what I've done in my classroom in the past. So for example, um, here's that tectonic motions map that Shelly showed a few slides ago when she was talking. And I love this map. I've had it up. It's up in, on the wall in my classroom. It's been up there for years. I was in love with it from the first time I saw it. It's such a cool visualization of GPS data in the West. And um, I also have printed out poster size. I have a bunch of poster size ones that I've printed out and laminated and I give it to my students and they use it with dry erase markers. They draw on it in an activity that we have done in the past in my classroom. And it's great and I love it. And it's really helpful visualization for the students. Um, but once the students have the laminated map in their hands, you know, um, the scientists have collected the data, scientists have analyzed the data, scientists have created this visualization, and the students didn't do any of that. So this is the NGSS Science and Engineering Practices. It's a list of eight practices that are incorporated into that practices dimension. And of those eight, honestly, the way that I have been doing the um, activity in my classroom, students have really been doing kind of two of those, right? They're really taking the map and constructing explanations and engaging in argument from evidence, but not much else. They might be asking a few questions, they might be doing some analysis, but in reality, it's mostly two. And that's okay. They're doing some science when they're doing this activity. But if you think about a three dimensional, my third dimension is a little flat in this activity. So then along came this opportunity to pilot the geocode module, and I loved it so much because here is a picture. This is a screenshot from the geocoder that Chris was using just a few minutes ago, and now my students are able to make the map, right? They're, in, they're able to go in there and make not just the map with the vectors, but many other visualizations. They're able to um, engage with these models, and they're able to ask questions and conduct investigations. So really, when they go through the entire geocode seismic hazards module, they are engaging in almost all of the science and engineering practices in a way that they weren't in my classroom before. So, and even maybe that last one, depending on how you wanted to wrap up your module in the classroom. So this is just that more, it's that three dimension, third dimension just gets much larger, right? I'm, I have a much more well-rounded opportunity for students to do science while they're learning about the this um, not just the plate boundary, but also how humans interact with the plate boundary. 
So I love it. It's great. I highly recommend it for classrooms. And that's how um, I wound up jumping in. And I have been um, working with Concord Consortium ever since. And I've really like a lot of their modules. So I'm hoping maybe you will become a new friend of Concord Consortium today because there's some great curriculum online and it's all free. It's all totally available. Um, we wanted our webinar to be three dimensional as well. We want you to experience it through doing it. So we are actually going to right now ask you all to go into your web browser. So it's possible um, you are in Zoom. I don't know if you're in full screen Zoom or not, but you can minimize your, you can either completely minimize your Zoom box or you can kind of make it a little smaller and open up your web browser. I'm going to ask you to open your web browser up and go take a look at the module and and Chris has gone through and the module is kind of long it took my class about a week to go through so that's a little much for our one hour um, webinar and so Chris has pulled out just a few pages to be a um, a sample for you so we're going to ask you to go to this website go to learn.conquer.org and Chris is putting that in the chat for you if you just want to click it but learn.conquer.org and when you get there we're going to ask you up in the top right, we're going to ask you to click register. And we want you to register as a student actually today. So you may or may not have ever been involved with Conquer Consortium. You may or may not have a teacher account. I'm hoping that after today, you're going to want a teacher account. And um, we want you to act as a student today to, to just do a few pages of the module. And so you should click I'm a student. And honestly, you should put in a, um, some kind of playful name as uh, your name because uh, I like to have a student. I have a student account and a teacher account because I like to log in as a student to my classes. And I don't like confusing my student, my fake student with my real teacher account. So I put in like, I put in my cat's name when I was doing, when I logged into this module. So enter any old name, um, it, make it PG rated because we will see, I'm going to show the list of us. So make some kind of student name and create some kind of password. This could be a throwaway password that you only use for today, or you might want to jot it down because if you wanted to start doing some of these modules with your classes, it's it can be really helpful to have that pretend student that you can go in and use and practice and things like that. So you might want to jot down your name and password, but you create um, a name that can be fake uh, and create a password. And once you do that, you're going to be asked for a class word. Um, and that's how students enter any classes that I set up for them. I give it a class word. Like I'll do things like Seavers period two or something, right? right? But today your class word is NAGT and it's not case sensitive. So ideally you have managed to migrate over to your web browser while you're listening to me multitasking as I know any classroom teacher is just so, so, so more accustomed to now after your pandemic than we even used to be. But um, you've migrated over to your web browser, you've gone to learn.conquer.org, registered as a student, entered the class word. It's then gonna ask you to re-enter your account information. It created a username for you. It created you a first initial last name username for you. And, um, and then it should have taken you to your assignment page. So, I am going to pause and just check if you're if you have if you're running into problems, feel free to unmute and shout out if you're having running into technical difficulties, but hopefully you're all kind of following along and getting in there. What when is the class word? The class word is NAGT. Thank you. Uh -huh, no problem. NAGT and it's not case sensitive. You can do all caps. You can do all lowercase. NAGT is our class word today. Yeah, uh, I put in my password, then when it says to confirm, I put in the exact same thing, and it says it doesn't match. I've tried it like four times. Oh my goodness. Um, maybe just, it doesn't have to be super secure. It's not. I just put in like a string of numbers, and then I put in the same string of numbers under confirm, and it says they do not match. Then I tried letters. I did the same letters, and uh -huh. they said that it does not match. Huh. Uh, uh, I don't know. I might read. I don't know how to resolve that issue other than to retype. I noticed that it dropped the first initial of my first name. So when I added it, it allowed me to log in. Oh, that's interesting. Making our lives better through technology. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks and these computers, are we can now make faster, more accurate mistakes. Right. And, and this is how it goes. So I, you know, I tried this. I've actually logged into this class. I've created two student accounts 
in preparation for this webinar just to make sure. And of course, the life of a teacher, right? We go through, we try it, we try it. And then all of a sudden when, you're, when your students are doing it, oh, there's these brand new problems that you've never encountered before. So technology. Um, okay, so hopefully, so some of you are going through and running and encountering some weird problems. And I'm hoping that maybe if you try, maybe even reloading the page or just completely retyping a new password, I hope you're able to manage it. If not, maybe we can go kind of off to the side with you. Oh, God. Um, the... So when you, if you do successfully let, register and log in, um, you're going to get this assignment page and it's gonna be uh, the NAGT presentation, April, 2021. That's the name of the assignment as Chris has made it. Um, and then you're gonna click run and that will take you into the module. Janie, you ended up in your teacher account even though you said you're registering as a student. Um, I don't know, Chris Laura, can she do this through a teacher account or does? Um, no, she couldn't, uh, but I would encourage you to log out of your teacher account and then use like a username and password that is completely different. Yeah, clear your cache, that's a good uh, suggestion. Mm -hmm. That's all I have. <laughs> yeah, and at learn.conquer.org, I've been able to just click log out and then I've been able to get the register button again. And again, I put in a completely different name when I was registering because I didn't want it confused with my teacher account. Mm -hmm. Best to just maybe a different browser. Um, so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna stay online and I'm gonna keep helping to problem solve for those of you who are still trying to get in. And uh, I am going to let you go, for those of you who are, who have experienced clear sailing, excellent, congratulations. Um, I am going to uh, troubleshoot with some people for a little while and I'm also going to let, let you work for a little while, but I'm planning to pause all of you at some point. So I'm letting you run through these pages but I will actually ask you to pause because I want to show you around the teacher dashboard. I want to show you, I've logged in as the teacher of this class and um, we're going to have a chat. And in fact, I can go over to the dashboard um, now in this, in this class and I am going to be able to even see how many of you are logged in. Um, and I have you anonymized right now, so I don't see the names that you put in, but um, I'm able to track your progress as you go through. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to let you work for a while, but then um, ideally I'm going to stop you before everyone's finished because it's kind of nice to see the class when people are at different places in their progress. So if you are um, go, if you have sailed right through the registration, great. Go ahead and work on the module. Go ahead and start clicking, clicking right through those. Um, if you haven't been able to log in yet, um, we want to help you. Who needs help? I put in what I thought was my username and my password, and it says my login failed. Mm -hmm. um, should I go back to the start? I might, like, we might be able to kind of troubleshoot that and maybe it gave you a, a funky username um, or something, but honestly, I would probably, since you're just making a fake throwaway student account, I might just start over. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I had the same trouble that it sounds like some other people are. Um, I think it combined the first and last pretend student name that I put mm -hmm. in into a username and but the and it made one up that you know sort of mushed them together and it but it, the error that it gave me seemed more like that it was confused about the password but when i noticed that and just used the username that it assigned it worked so okay, that good. might be what they're running into yeah okay thanks randy Uh, hi, I can't hear the video for from the uh, uh, on the simulations. Huh. 
that's so strange, especially since we know your volume's on because you can hear me. So yeah. why, could, why couldn't you hear the video? That's a great question. Chris, any ideas? Uh, Zoom might take preference in your audio settings. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, if you go to your audio settings, you may be able to set like computer audio or something like that. And then it'll, you'll hear the what's showing on your computer instead of Zoom maybe. Uh, that's my best guess. Mm -hmm. If you aren't able to troubleshoot that because you don't want to log out of Zoom or something like that, it's okay. You don't have to watch the video to do this module. It's actually, it's, um, it's me. In fact, I was explaining, I did a little PowerPoint video explaining uh, relative motion is really what that's intended. So we, um, Chris put it in there just as an example, every once in a while in, in these modules, there is a short video that we've created just to help students out and with concepts that we think are a little difficult. We don't like to put massive essays of text. So when we thought about explaining relative motion, we thought, oh no, this is, this is, we've written too much. It's too much. Students aren't happy when they click on a web page and see, a, you know, an acre of text. So we've created a video. So if you want to watch it, fantastic. Um, if you don't, if it's not working, just, you can skip it. Let's hang on to the question, uh, is there a way for a teacher to try out the module without setting up a class, like repeat that when we're through this section? Because that's a really good question. Thank you, Martin. We can hear someone chewing. You might want to check your uh, your mute buttons. Is there a way for students to add data to any of these maps from a GPS that they or a seismometer that they might have at their school? Not in this module. Mm -mm. Sorry to say, it's uh, the module is looking at those stations that were given to it, and, and looking at a particular database, right, with the stations that you know Co gave us. It's a good idea though, it would be pretty cool. There's a question about not being able to find the module in the resources on Concord. And I was wondering if someone could answer that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Chris, it's yeah. still being piloted, right? Yes, it's still being piloted. I'll talk about that a little later, um, but we're thinking in the fall, we'll release it to the public. Uh, right now you can only view it on our website if uh, we give you access to view it on our website. Um, I just I have a question, quick question. How do you set the start or end date? Is that the name function? Uh, yeah, yep. Yeah. yep, if you use the name function, you can type in a date uh, with dashes or slashes uh, and it will, it will work. 
or you can just type in like a year if you want just a number you can just type in year 2000 and it'll start at January 1st 2000 or whatever okay so I did the one slash one slash 20 hundred and then the one slash one slash 2020 and it's telling me I can't parse those dates um that may be because we don't have data for that point I'm, uh, uh, it's the one you told me to go to which is p537 okay. right well maybe I'll try you, this year. did you do it as a name or a number that's what it I said to do it as the name yeah yeah okay mm -hmm. okay yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not, I don't think, I'm not really seeing anything. It just says make a model. <laughs> I click on it, nothing really pops up except a blank graph. Okay, what page are you on? I don't know. It just says create a model of your choice run by myself. It says question number six at the top of the page, positions over time. No. Geocoder, question no. six. No. It just says classes and offerings. Create a model of your choice. Why do I feel colder when I am wet than when I am dry? Pre-unit interest survey, pre-unit scientific model survey post-unit interest survey, post-unit scientific model survey. Okay, that's not what you uh, should be seeing. So I know that, but then, you know, that's what I get when I log in. Okay, let me try to fix that on my end. So back so to the date oh. issue. I tried just putting in the year and it still is telling me it can't parse it. Okay, try using a data block, just a number block instead of the um, name block. Okay, got it. Uh, so I'm putting in a number. Well, how do I get rid of the, the one that I- uh, There's a trash can in the bottom right corner. Trash if you can, can that I block. see it. Yeah. Okay, I have trashed the, the date via names and now I'm gonna try sliding a number over there. Okay. I'm going to start with just the, um, trying just the year. That seems a little less demanding. And no matter what I hit, I just come back to the same page over and over and over again. Hmm. That's frustrating. Okay. I'm going to send you a uh, username and password to put log in with, and then that should take you to the right page. The number suggestion worked. Okay, great. great. So use the number block and not the name block. And not the name block. That's my bad. I'm sorry. Kim, were you able to get it to take more than a single digit in the number block? You're grabbing the block that says four because I can only get it to take one digit. Uh, no, I got it to take 2000 and then oh. 2020. Try again. Start date and the end date. And then it made me a lovely graph. I'll try again. I'm going to go ahead and pause. I'm going to ask you to pause what you're doing. I know you're in all in different places, but it's, we're, it's getting down towards the end of the hour. And I wanted to be sure you got a chance to see the dashboard. So wherever you are, and, and by the way, you can keep this tab and you can always go back to this. This is a, we're not going to delete this, um, this little module, the sample module at all. So you can, you can have that to do, but it is getting late. And I wanted to, I wanted you to be able to see the dashboard because it's wonderful and it has been completely revamped this fall. And so from my first time piloting this to the second time, the dashboard had changed and I thought you'd want to take a look. So I'm still sharing my screen and I, I have the dashboard up with the, with this class. I'm going to refresh my browser just to make sure. And so when I come into my, um, from my STEM resource finder, I, I have this chance to click a class dashboard for any of my classes. And so if I click the class dashboard for this one, I come here and I can expand and see these are all the pages that have questions. 
And if you look, so if I, for any reason, wanted to put my, my dashboard up on my screen, share my screen with students, or I wanted a student to be able to look over my shoulder, I can anonymize students, which is great. So they can't see each other's names, but then I can also keep it with their names open. Um, so I can see that as well. And I can, organ, right now this is organized by student name. Um, it gives them a number if I anonymize it, but I can also organize it by least progress. So let's, I wanna see who hasn't gotten anywhere, right? And see where people are. I can see the most progress just if I wanna know who's done. Um, and so this gives me a really quick look at how are my students doing in this class? So this is great. I can go into a question. So if I click on question one, I can go in and I can, um, for example, uh, and by the way, I might be like, wait, what was question one? And see this little plot button. This can actually take me straight to see it in the on the page. So, oh, right, right. Question one's here. Now I remember what question one is. I can view all the responses. So here I can see all of my students' responses right away. Um, and I can even go in and give my students feedback. So I can go into this feedback report and I can go in and I can offer feedback to students. So um, student 33 says the more data, the better. And I might say, amen. You know, I can offer feedback to students right away. Um, and then in my dashboard, I can see where I've given um, Given feedback, I'll get this little green triangle. If a student updates their answer based on my feedback, I'll get that as well. So I can go back to my progress dashboard and I can see here, student 27, I believe that's my um, cat, uh, Ricky Ticky Tavi, yeah. Um, I, had, I had done it and given myself some feedback and so you can see Ricky Ticky Tavi got um, feedback here and hasn't done anything about it, but got feedback here and did change his answer. So um, these are all some wonderful things that you can really be involved in in real time with your students in the dashboard. So I think that's fantastic. Um, I had intended to um, spend a little time talking about how the pilot went at Evergreen High School. I'm not going to because it's 155 and I really want to make sure that Chris gets a chance to talk about the um, the your possible chance to pilot if you're interested in these modules. So I'm going to skip ahead and, and just to say there's a picture of one of my teammates and I'm going to say that um, I had some just a few tips on there and it went really well even though it was pandemic time. The pilot went great and we're all very excited. We think we're going to be back in the classroom next year and we think it's going to be even better because these while these modules, while the students were able to go through these modules on their own, at home asynchronously, the, they're that well designed. That's not really what they were meant for. They were meant to be taught. They're meant to be in the classroom and talked about and done in small groups and with the teacher. So we can't wait to get, get our hands on those with students in the room with us. And I'm gonna let Chris talk about potentially piloting it if you're interested. Yeah, so uh, we're always looking in pilot testing. Obviously, uh, we still have, um, this is a beta version, so we're still working out kinks and we're still looking at um, trying to find the best way to support teachers when they and students when they go through this module. Um, so if you're interested in being a pilot teacher, uh, we're looking for people to pilot it uh, towards the end of May and in June, kind of towards the end of the school year. Um, so if you're interested, please click the link uh, in the slide, learn.cochran.org slash geocode. Um, I can put that in the chat after I'm done. And um, there's a, if you scroll down to the bottom of that page, there's an apply now. You'll just fill out a quick Google form and we'll get your name, your email address, your school information, uh, and we'll contact you uh, for piloting it. Uh, like I said before, if you want to, if you think about using it but don't have the time this year, uh, we're going to release it publicly uh, for the fall semester. So you'll just be able to go to learn.cochran.org, search for the seismic hazards module or the volcanic hazards module if you're interested in TEFRA, and be able to uh, assign it to your class um, from there with um, without us having to, uh, you know, sign you up for you. 